Andy Porwell for Boxing Social in association with Betfred. And for the first time this year in 2021, I am delighted to be joined by trainer Tony Sims over Zoom. Tony, Happy New Year. I know it's probably a little bit late, but it's the first time I've had the chance to say it to you. I hope you could enjoy the festive period as much as possible. Did you get up to much? No, not much. <laughs> Well, hopefully we can kind of get through this, this boxing interview as quickly as possible, Tony, because I know he's getting on a little bit now. Um, a lot of fighters for yourself kind of get, getting fight announcements recently, so let's get straight into it. Start off with Ted Cheeseman. Um, he's got as his bout with JJ Metcalf, announced the first of your fighters getting back into the ring. Talk to me about that fight, obviously a British title on the line. Yeah, uh, vacant British title on the line and... Obviously, Metcalf's got the Commonwealth title, so uh, big fight for Ted and for Metcalf. They're, they're uh, both highly ranked in the IBF ratings as well. So, um, yeah, I think it'd be another hard fight for Ted. Um, you know, Metcalf's a good fighter, and uh, I think it'd be like another war of attrition for both of them. Ted's been seen around the domestic scene now for, for quite a while. If he comes away with a British title once again, what is going to be the plan with him, Tony? Are you looking to kind of push him back through and get through the, the ranks again? Obviously, he fell short in his European title tilt. But aside from that, what is kind of the plan with uh, Ted moving forward? Yeah, well, as I said then, he's eye in the rankings. I think he's about number eight with the IBF. I think uh, James Metcalf is uh, number five with the IBF. So obviously, if he wins the British and Commonwealth, it'll just push him higher up into the rank rankings, you know, and just take it uh, fight by fight, step by step. You know, he's only just turned 25 still, and he's he's been in a lot of good fights, and um, you know, he's got getting a lot of experience now behind him. He's fought a lot of good fighters, so you know, he. he each time he fights, he improves a little bit. So we'll just take it one step at a time. As I say, if he beats Metcalf, then, you know, the, the door's open for a lot of big fights for him. What do you make of Metcalf and what exactly are you expecting from him? You know, most people will remember him most recently from his victory over Jason Wellborn. But what are you expecting from him this time around? Yeah, you know, he's a, he's a good fighter and... Uh, you know, we all know his daddy, Shane Neary, and, you know, he, he's got a very similar style to uh, Shane Neary. You know, he's uh, he's always in great condition. And, um, you know, obviously, this is a big step-up fight for him because, you know, aside from Wellborn, he hasn't really fought anybody at all. You know, I think Wellborn's his biggest name opponent, so it's a massive step-up for him, you know, and... Um, as I said earlier, Ted's got a lot of experience. He's fought a lot of good fighters. So, you know, Ted's expecting an hard fight. You know, he's been been in training since well, way before Christmas and um, he'd be in great condition as always. And, um, you know, as I said, it's going to be a really hard fight for both of them. So I did an interview with Sam Eggington the other day and by his own admission, he doesn't see the rematch happening now. Is that a fight which, in your eyes, it just you just you just don't see it happening either? You don't know in boxing what's going to happen. You know that was a great fight last year, and um, you know it's a shame that that fight couldn't be made. And uh, you know Sam's moved on, and he had a great win last time. And uh, you know Ted's moving on, and he's got a vacant British title fight coming up. But you never know. You know that their, their styles clash will always clash in a fight. And um, you never know, you never know in this game what's going to happen. Is it something you as a trainer are a little wary of at all, Tony, when you have, when you see a in Ted's case, when he has the fights where he does have, where they can be very, you know, have take their toll on the body. Is it something you're wary of? Because obviously later in life, we have seen some of the, the, the health problems fighters can suffer with. Sure, you know, he's he's only young at the moment, you know, and uh, he's still a young man. So, you know, I, I don't suppose Ted's going to be thinking of fighting way into his 30s. He's not got that sort of style. You know, he's going to, you know, I expect him to get in and, you know, win as many fights as he can, get as much money as, as he can and get out again, you know. But he knows that himself. He's not, he's not stupid, you know, and uh, 
he's got a really good business as well, building business that he started, and that's that's going well for him at the moment. So, you know, I, I expect Ted not to have a really long career in this game anyway. Just to know, I want to get your thoughts on at like middle. There's one between Anthony Fowler and Jorge Fortier. What are your thoughts on that Fowler again, a potential future opponent for Ted? Yeah, I don't know nothing about the opponent, to be honest. I've never seen him before or heard of him. So, you know, I expect Anthony Fowler, who's a good fighter, you know, he um, he should do another number on him. It's just a shame he ain't really getting into the big fights or the big names, but I'm sure he will do eventually. You know, he's a very good fighter, Anthony, and um, as you say, his prospective opponent for Ted, if he comes through, you know. To get your thoughts moving forward, uh, Tony, March 20th on the Okoli Glavatsky card, Joe Cordina returns, a man who many are looking forward to seeing back in the ring. What should we expect to see from Joe this time round? Obviously, waiting for an opponent announce, an announcement. Yeah, uh, Joe had a major uh, operation on his metacarpal bones. He's had them fused together in, uh, he had that done in July. So, um, you know, his hands all fine now. He's back. Uh, He's back in the bag, in the pads. It's all fine in his hand. So we look forward to him um, coming back uh, in March. And um, yeah, I'm excited about Joe coming back. He's a great uh, prospect. And um, I expect him to get back in the, in the ring and a win under his belt. And then maybe this year, move into World Honours this year. As I mentioned in my question, Tony, we're waiting for an announcement on who he will be facing on March 20th. With that in mind, when he was meant to box in Cardiff before lockdown and what have you, uh, he was saying he was looking at somebody who had fought at world level before. In his comeback fight this time around, because he's been so long out of the ring for him, what standard of opponent do you expect to see him in with? Yeah, well... In Cardiff, he, we was looking at Johnny Gonzalez, weren't we? I think that he was trying to make that fight. So I expect a bit of a lower standard fight, uh, you know, opponent for him, because obviously he's been that much out and, you know, he wants to test his hand out. But providing that fight goes well and then, um, you know, he'll step up to the plate and fight, you know, a really world-class opponent. And as I say, we look to get him into, into world honours by the end of this year. Moving forward again, Tony, to get your thoughts on April 10th, Bill, uh, Connor Ben versus Samuel Vargas. Talk to me about, about the thinking behind the matchmaking there, Tony. Yeah, well, we all know uh, Sammy Vargas. He's a tough customer. And I mean, I think everyone remembers him from uh, when he had Amir Khan on the floor. And it was, you know, it was a great fight, that fight. And, you know, he could have caused the upset that night. But he's been in with all the big names, you know, Garcia. He's been in with everyone. So, you know, he, he, he's a tough kid and he's a warrior. And, you know, I think it's a good name for, again, for Conor Ben to step up to. Uh, you know, I think he's a, you know, he's a, he's a good fighter to learn from. He's a good learning fighter. And, you know, it'd be Conor Ben's first 12-round fight. And, um, you know, I, I believe Conor's improving all the time and he needs opponents like this who's been at world level, box world level fighters, and um, yeah, he'll gain great experience from fighting someone like this. Tony, in Connor's case, we all see the, the progress he's made when he fights, but when he's training behind the scenes, we don't ever see him talking about it. We just see him, he just gets on with it. What's been the most impressive thing about, about that for yourself and having to deal with Connor and the progress that we are seeing with him and his career and his ability? Well, he's had to, firstly, he's had to deal with a lot of pressure, you know, you know, being, having his second name of Ben, you know, and his dad, Nigel, being a legend. So, you know, he's had to deal with a massive, great pressure, as Chris Eubank Jr. has had to. And um, yeah, it's not easy for him, but, you know, I feel like he's he's put himself behind closed doors and he's learned, he's learned, he's like a sponge, you know, he takes everything in, goes away, learns, comes back again and, and I think each fight that he's had, I think we've seen we've seen him improve that little bit more, you know. And I'm expecting um, in this fight for him to prove a little bit more again and gain that sort of experience from being in with decent opponents. One fight which has been spoken about for well, probably a couple of years now for Connor is the Josh Kelly one, an all British affair, if it could go down. 
Um, just to touch on Josh, he's obviously facing David Avenisian for the EBU title. Just your thoughts on that first and foremost? Yeah, that, that's a great fight, you know, and uh, obviously that's been talked about for ages, that fight, you know, it's been on and off and, um, you know, um, I hope Josh comes through, I really do, you know, it's a tough fight, it's a 50-50 fight, but I hope Josh comes through and they can keep this rivalry going because this is what we want, we want big domestic fights in Britain, you know, British rivalries and, um, you know, Conor Ben and Josh Kelly are a polar opposites of styles and probably people as well, which always goes for a good clash. And, um, you know, I just hope that he can come through and maybe later on in the year, you know, a couple of more fights and, and then they get into the ring. That's what I was going to say, Tony, do you see that fight happening this year or is it something which maybe does need a bit more time to, to mull over? You just got to see how they both go. You know, they've both got big fights coming up, both of them. So, you know, one step at a time, you know, Josh needs to win, Connor needs to win, you know, the fight needs to build a bit more and, um, you know, we see how it goes. I'm sure the fight's going to happen eventually. Just to stick with Connor's card against um, Samuel Vargas, April 10th, we know Felix Cash is on the undercard. The British, board, British Boxing Board of Control have ordered the Denzel Bentley fight for the British title. Um do you think that fight could happen on the card or is that too soon? It could do. Um, I know that's going to go out to purse bids. I think Eddie's in talks for the European title as well with Sigani. So we'll just see how it goes. I'll leave that side of it to Eddie to do, you know, but all I know is that he's going to be boxing on April the 10th. And um, so we'll just see who the opponent's going to be. For you, who would you like to see Felix face and who would Felix himself like to face? Well, Felix wants to win the British title, so, you know, he, he's a good fighter, Felix, and he, he wants to win the British title, but at the end of the day, he's sort of up to Eddie what he wants to do with him, you know. And, um, you know, obviously, I think if Eddie wins the purse bids, he'll go on April the 10th. Maybe if Eddie don't win the purse bids, maybe he'll go for the European title. So, we'll see. Just moving away from uh, that one as well, just get your thoughts on a few fighters who don't have announcements, but I imagine they're probably nibbling at the, the heels of everybody to try and get on one of the cards. Uh, start off with John Doherty. First, you just go back to his defeat versus Jack Cullen. Uh, just reflecting on it for me, Tony, how would you assess it now? Well, we're part of company now, anyway, me and John Doherty. So I don't know. I don't. I haven't really spoken to him since since the fight. So... I've wished him all the best and uh, I think I think you'll find that he'll be training with somebody else. I didn't know that, Tony. Um, obviously, just, I imagine that he just wasn't posted over social media. Can I, do you mind me asking the reasons behind that? Uh, just an amicable split, really. You know, he's uh, he, he lives a long way away from his home, as you know. And, um, you know, it was just an amicable split and, you know, I wish him all the best in his career. Um, away from John then, Tony, Martin Ward, again, just waiting for news as to what will be next for him. Yeah, Martin's waiting for his, uh, he, he's waiting for, he's supposed to be doing a final eliminator for the IBF title. Obviously, um, Jojo Diaz, he's fighting, um, Rak is it Rakim, I think, uh, he's mandatory challenger. And uh, Martin's waiting for the purse bids to go from the IBF to to do a final eliminator. So I'm just waiting to hear from Eddie what's going on there, really. But that's his next step anyway, by the looks of things. Then just moving forward and on to the last man, I believe, to touch on, John Ryder. Obviously going back again to his victory on the Triple G undercard. Came up against a man in Mike Guy who just did not seem like he wanted to interact with John, just reflecting on the performance. What what did you make of it? I've not the ideal fight for John to, to effectively look good in. No, I mean, you know, when we got offered um, Mike Guy, I watched a couple of um, recordings of him and, you know, he's boxed a couple of decent fighters and he, he come to fight, you know, and uh, it was funny because I said to John before the fight, you know, he's going to come out swinging for the first couple of rounds and, to be aware and, you know, to counter punch him. But he just, he didn't come forward and throw any punches at all. He was just like, it was unbelievable. I just, we did, I didn't expect him to do that, you know. So 
you can never tell what's going through people's mind, but it was if he was fighting Triple G, you know what I mean? He just he just didn't want to come nowhere near him. You know, he yelled as soon as John got near him. So it made for a bit of a drab fight, really. But, you know, John got 10 rounds under his belt, which was needed because obviously he hadn't boxed for like since the Smith fight. So he hadn't had a fight for 13 months. So now Canelo's... Um, Won that won the WBA Super against uh, Callum Smith. He's he's vacated the regular, so John's in line to fight for the regular. So we're just going to wait for that to be announced, and that'll go to um, that'll go to purse bids as well. Do you know who he's in line to face for the regular title? I think it might be the number one guy. Um, David Morrell, the Cuban kid who's living in Florida. I think he's the interim champ now. So I think it might be him. But as I say, I'm waiting for Eddie to hear back from the WBA to see um, who John's going to fight for that title. But Eddie's, Eddie's saying it'd be around April time. Just get your thoughts on the super middleweight division, Tony. Whilst I've got you, Smith Canelo taking place the night after John Ford. Just going back to that, what did you make of uh, Canelo's victory? Oh yeah, he looked he looked fantastic, didn't he, Canelo? And uh, you know, he's he he's got so much class about him, he makes things look easy. And you know, Callum Smith's a good fighter, and Callum Smith can bang as well. And uh but the way he just won every round, he just won it as though he was only in second gear, really. Do you know what I mean? And uh it just shows you what a clever fighter he is. You can't he's very hard to now with with any single punch and you know, he's, he's very hard to read and he's slipping and sliding, he's counter punching, he's brilliant, you know, and he just makes it look easy in there. We've seen Billy Joe Saunders mentioned as a possible opponent for Canelo for May, provided Canelo overcomes Avni Yildirim, he's WBC mandatory. If that one does go ahead between Canelo and Billy Joe, obviously, again, if Canelo overcomes Yildirim, does Billy Joe possess the style to upset Canelo? I hope so, you know, I'd love to see. Obviously, you love to see Billy Joe get in there and do the business, but you know it's an it's an hard one because Canelo fights. He's as I say, he's hard to land a single shot on on him. His defense is that good. He can't punch you so quick, and he makes things look easy. He's a very very difficult man to beat. And, you know, he's a brilliant man to watch. But you know, Billy Joe's a very clever fighter, and you know if he can produce the sort of form that he did against David Lemieux, you can't really count him out of a fight. But it's going to be a technical fight, you know, a tactical fight. And, um, you know, I hope that fight does get made and I look forward to watching that fight. Right, Tony, we will leave it there now. I'll leave you to enjoy the rest of your evening. As I said, he's getting on a bit. Um, I appreciate your time. Uh, I'll keep in touch. Best of luck with everybody's preparations. And thank you for speaking to Boxing Social. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, mate. 